Hello, welcome back. We're at Minds of Money, and I'm with Mark Itafani, the former CEO of Anglo Gold Ashanti, Anglo American, and the current chairman of Vale's Base Metals Unit. Mark, good seat. Thank you. Um, just kick things off. Obviously, I've given you a bit of an intro there, but I wouldn't mind just just a real bit of an overview as to who you are, and I guess your journey as to why you've decided to take the Vale position, uh, the chairman of, of the Base Metals Division. That. Um, Again, uh, a mining engineer. Um, my children don't think that's a positive, but I'd like to remind them that uh, the mining industry, from an environmental point of view, is the most important industry in the face of the planet in terms of net positive outcomes. Agreed. In terms of shrinking human footprints, all those sorts of things. Uh, they get that lecture every second night. Yep. But anyway, that's who we are. Um, I wasn't going to go back into a role as close to the business as I have done with base metals. However, I uh, was the COO for INCO many years back. Remember the operations, good relationship with Vale. Um, they were looking to do something very different. It's very topical uh, for the industry today, right in the middle of the energy transition, which is what I was thinking about being involved in uh, on retirement through infrastructure uh, and a whole range of things. So it sort of brought a few things together, plus there was a little bit of um, in back to the future yeah. uh, thinking in that and, and many friends still at Vale and good relationships. So, but what was the fit? What was the opportunity though? You, you, when you looked at Vale, obviously there's operationally, I've heard you speak before about there's lots of fixing to be done and lots of improvements there. But I guess even on the M&A side, so how, how have you looked at this? You've, I, I assume they've approached you to, to become the chairman. Yeah. You would have had a process of saying, what can I add? What what needs to be done? What, what... Well, firstly, I think nickel, copper, precious metals, right in the middle of the energy transition. It's also a group that understands how important mining's work is in providing infrastructure and helping communities. So right mindset. Third point, lots of opportunities. So if you look in Brazil, massive uh, copper potential in my view and their operations typify that. Sudbury, Manitoba, Boise Bay, great resource positions, but probably not doing as well as they've had in the past. And that's mainly around resource changes. And I think with my experience and, and with some of the people that we've brought in to help, we can help them look at transitioning based on the resources they have today. And that's a big change required, but at the same time, the, the basic resources are there, good people. Uh, needs a little bit of different thinking, and I think we can bring that. Indonesia will be probably the centre of nickel mining in the world uh, in the future, and I think it's important to be part of that and to be able to play a constructive role in how that's taken forward. And then there's the rest of the world, and so there are great opportunities everywhere, and we've got a great base to start with. Well, there's a few things I wouldn't mind touching on there, but I guess the, the growth aspect of we were chatting to Barrett yesterday and they were, they were talking about by 2030, 30% growth in terms of ounces produced. Have, have you set any goals in terms of what the team should be striving for at Vale? Well, we, we, we've talked about beyond 2030. We haven't put a final date on it, but we're talking about 300,000 tonnes of nickel, 900,000 tonnes of copper. So it's an almost doubling of the business. But again, there's a long path to get to. Uh, those sort of numbers and uh, we've got our Vale day on the 5th so we'll talk a little bit more about the potential okay. but again we won't change those numbers until we've got something I think more concrete in terms of our plans and that's a works in progress and during the course of next year I think we'll be pretty clear on where we're going with copper, nickel and the PGM's business and also we'll define I think a bit better how we think about M&A opportunities where wherever that may be appropriate. Okay, are you able to, touch, obviously I know that more to be released, uh, I'm sure you're probably limited until the 5th, until what, what you can say, but on the M&A side, are there any strict criteria? Obviously you're, it makes sense for larger companies to, to pick up land where they have existing projects, obviously for infrastructure wise and cost wise, but are you looking at new jurisdictions within Vale and I guess the size of the deposit, greater deposit, what, what, what attracts you to make an investment into a new jurisdiction if you are going to go into one. So, so firstly, you've got to go where the resources are. And I heard Mark Bristow say, geology over geography. He's absolutely right. I think it's a great line. They told him already that I'm going to steal it. Yeah. I think it's the right way to think about things. So literally, um, 
myself, I'm, I've worked literally on every continent except the Antarctica. Yep. Uh, so I understand, or I have an understanding. Uh, we've all got lots to learn. So there are no jurisdictions that we would say no go. Certainly ones we'd have to take certain, certain risk uh, measures and the way we operated, and then that factors into how you assess the geology. But generally, we go where the, where the resources are. Um, one, we have to be able to add value to what we see. Two, in adding value, it has to make sense from an investment perspective, and it has to compete with our organic opportunities for us to put money there instead of maybe developing an internal project. So the internal hurdles will be quite strict and rigorous, but at the same time, there are lots of opportunities out there. One thing we believe in the industry, and this is after 47 years, there are very few people that really can get their heads around the resource they have, understand the value opportunities inside those resources, and can actually bring them to the market and deliver on potential. I think that we've demonstrated we can do that, and that's where I think our advantage is. But from, I guess, from your geo's perspective and from your M&A perspective, I wouldn't mind to push you a bit more. I mean, surely it needs to have the scale for you, for someone like Bali to be attractive. It needs to, it needs to be a pretty large, pretty chunky deposit, right? And and there's, I guess, following on for that, if you're going to look outside of Indonesia, especially in the nickel space, where where are you going to be finding these type of large, higher grade nickel, especially the sulfides? Um, so. What, what I would say is, when you look at uh, large, or it, it, it really is economic outcome or financial outcomes, uh, making a contribution to society, delivering a real return to shareholders means there has to be materiality there. But it may not be in the first step you take, because quite often small deposits have been developed um, using the information that people like. But what about regional endowments and how good could it be? So we take a bigger picture view on what we think the region could be. And sometimes, and in fact, most cases, it's better to go in small, undercapitalized. We can bring and support developments and then look at building a regional position, which becomes very material. And I think history says that's probably when you do your best business and when you make the most money. When you go in when it's very early, and you can build and see the opportunities that you can create. And with Vale, we've got that ability to make a difference. Good. How are you looking at this current market? I wouldn't mind touching on that, actually. Obviously, we're at a junior mining conference here. Um, commodities prices in base metals aren't, aren't the best right now. There's a lot of junior, even mid-tier companies that are hurting quite a bit, and their market caps are, are down quite substantially from even where they were a year ago. For a company like Vale, it, is this an opportunity for you? I know you're... You've sort of been saying that maybe down the line that that M and A pipeline is something that you'll focus on more before internal. But given the opportunity in the market and things are quite cheap, is now not a good time for? So, so the opportunities are there, but at the same time we're not performing as well as we could. Yeah. So first thing we have to do is make sure that we improve both for copper in the nickel businesses, and there's lots of potential to do better. So that's where our primary focus has to be up front. But at the same time, understanding what potential we have and then looking at other opportunities, we're playing one off against the other. But again, the organic investment opportunities are significant. So it's going to be good, or has to be good, to beat that in the short term. But we are taking the longer term view, particularly with large resource endowment positions that we think have got high potential. So it's, it's that sort of internal trade-off. And, but we still think there are lots of things around that are interested. Okay. The rumours are obviously that within three to four years, you're you're thinking of essentially an IPO for the base metals business. I assume spinning out of um, of, of the Vale Group. What, what's the strategy? What's the thinking behind that? And I guess what what sort of conditions do you need to make that reality? Well, if I quote um, Eduardo, the CEO of Vale, um, he talked about a liquidity event, whatever that may mean. But strip it down to its bare essentials. How do we create a business that is a brother or a sister to the iron ore business? Yeah. And that by implication means we have to grow organically and secondly, consider value accretive external opportunities. And that's what we're doing. And we're trying to head towards that. What does another Vale iron ore look like in the base metals business? 
And so that's a pretty lofty goal. You know, our first objective, well, you would have seen our valuation off the acquisition, off the um, uh, recent uh, purchase was about 26, 27 billion. We've obviously got to take a step to improve that position. And then there's another couple of big steps to get ourselves towards the Vale valuation, which I think is trading very cheaply at the moment, given the IL price. But that gives you a sense of where we want to go and how we want to, and we know how we want to get there organically. There may be some M&A required, but we still think we've got a lot of potential in what we have today. Good. Okay. I guess, obviously, these large, large, large growth plans are becoming just as large as the iron ore business. And all of this hinges on the actual base metal market itself, right? Uh, I think, and I wouldn't mind really getting your view at the moment, obviously, post-COVID, a lot of people were expecting China to be, I guess, let's say, a little bit more similar and their economy to be boosted a little bit a little bit quicker out of their own lockdown so i wouldn't mind just getting a pulse on where you think the market is why, why you see commodity prices so low as they are and yep. and, and sort of looking a bit further forward. one thing i'm very careful of is uh, is the word as large as it's actually as valuable as yeah okay. uh so it's all about returns so it's not about size it's about returns so we want to be able to make at least as good a contribution to the business as the iron ore business or better yeah so I think that's important, and, and I say that for shareholders in particular. So we're focused on value. That's the first point. Second point, in terms of the market, uh, the potential for um, uh, prices growth, I think copper, very strong prospects going forward. Uh, I think the world's generally short copper. We've got so many different uses of copper. So I think copper's a great position. Nickel, a little bit tougher in the short term. And you've got some volumes that will come on in Indonesia. But again, long term, we're short nickel as well. So I think they're two great positions. Precious metals are a little bit tougher. We produce precious metals as well. But again, uh, with material sciences, I think uh, the precious metals position will improve. And I think platinum is still in a pretty good place. Palladium a bit tougher at the moment. When you look at China, China, uh, we're probably not going to see the 6 to 7% growth, but you're still going to see pretty strong growth in the three to five percent range and if they're in that range then the world's still a pretty good place if you're in the minerals industry because we can't keep up with that demand in any case and you look at it today the the operations that are struggling in copper um no different in some cases in nickel as well uh, i think uh, for a company that can deliver on its potential uh, the market will be there and the prices will be pretty solid are you are you in the camp that electrification and electric vehicles are really what's going to be driving these base metals market or are you more aligned with you sort of see copper and, and a lot of these base metals sort of in, usually increase along with gdp uh, around the world and and really it's going to be construction and iron ore and really the the, the main markets that we already see in these base metals that, that are going to be driving look driving I, and i make a really important point firstly we'll do with with gdp we'll grow with gdp but both copper and nickel have a proportionally higher uh, consumption per person as we grow and modernise and middle class grow. So I think that's one fact. Uh, two, because of the, the breadth of use of copper, there are many different demand variables and in fact, medical, whole range of other things. So I think again, that'll be very positive. In nickel, the most important ingredient in the um, uh, energy transition is in fact steel and infrastructure and nickel as a specialty alloy and involved in stainless steel and other things it's got many other market perspectives as well so i think both uh, copper and nickel are well positioned in the broader growth of of uh, the economy and the modernization and the growth of the middle class so it's not only growth it's the type of growth we're going to see that favors both copper and nickel longer term so you see more as demographic changes and and rather than technology change. It's, way to say. it's, it's yeah. demographic, it's um, where value is, it's the change in energy and change in other technologies as well that are driving these new consumptions. And AI will also, in our view, help material sciences and mineral sciences improve how we perform and, and will identify new uses, new uses for these metals and therefore, we think that favours us as well. That's why I don't give up on precious metals as well. Good. Okay. Uh, just a couple of real quick things that I want to fire at you just to get an idea. Um, throughout your long career, what's been your biggest achievement so far? Safety. I think yeah. 
uh, over many years, I think we've demonstrated the ability to make a real difference on safety. And that's always the one that I think is the key indicator in terms of have you got people together, working together, looking after each other? That's the first thing. Uh, I think our work on sustainability, I think we've changed the conversation around the mining industry. Still a long way to go. I introduced myself last night to someone. They said, what do you do for a living? I said, well, I work in the industry that's got the most significant positive, net positive environmental footprint on the face of the planet. And I had to, after she had about three guesses, I said mining and her jaw dropped. And then when I explained how we reduce the world's human footprint, she said, boy, I'm going to have to go away and think about that. I've never thought of mining as being net positive in terms of environmental outcomes. Well, actually, that's really important. Before I fire a few more at you, but real quick, could you could you just expand on that, on, on how mining does have a net environmental outcome? Yeah, very simple. Agriculture, 40% of the world's habitable land. Use of fertilisers, that's how we feed 8 billion people. If we didn't have fertilisers, we could only feed 4 billion people. So if we didn't have fertilisers, we'd have to expand the agricultural footprint to 50 to 60% of habitable land. Second, urban footprints. We build up because we have the products of minerals. If we didn't have the products of minerals, we'd have to build out. Yep. And again, expand that 15% footprint to 20 to 30%. So when you look at our human footprint at about 55%, it would be 25% bigger, which means biodiverse areas are the first to go without the products for minerals. So when you take into account, we take up 0.3% of the Earth's surface, net, net, significant net positive environmental footprint. And I'm not even talking about energy transition and the fact you use minerals for everything in terms of matter, material uh, products, then people start to think, wait a minute, we, we're not judging these guys correctly. Yeah. A uh, couple more. What's, what's the biggest challenge moving forward with Bali? Do you think what, what's, what's the big challenges that you're going to need to tackle? I think navigating the change that we need to deliver to realise our potential. And that has to be three people. So working with the team. So it's the biggest challenge. It's also the biggest opportunity. Well, that was going to be my next question. Um, so we'll end it there. Mark, thank you very much. That's right.